During the fighting on the Eastern Front, the Germans learned that fortified cities can only be taken with heavy losses in men and material. Particularly problematic targets were well-entrenched enemy positions that ordinary artillery could not deal with. To dislodge the defenders, they had to be engaged with direct fire from large-caliber guns. Ordinary towed artillery was not suited for this role, being too heavy and vulnerable. The only logical solution to this problem was to develop a fully protected and well-armed self-propelled artillery vehicle. This role was initially fulfilled by the Stug III assault guns. Their 7.5cm gun was not quite suited to deal with more fortified positions, and something stronger was needed. A series of assault guns based on the Panzer III and IV, armed with a 15cm gun, was introduced and put to service. Despite the huge improvement in the fighting power, even stronger weapons were requested by the German army. This would come in the form of the Sturm Tiger, armed with a huge 38cm rocket launcher. The development of the vehicle that would eventually evolve into Sturm Tiger was initiated by Hitler on 5th of August 1943. One prototype was to be built to test if the whole concept would be feasible. Given that the requirements asked for heavy main armament and armor, a suitable chassis that could bear this weight had to be found. This would come in the form of the Tiger heavy tank. For the main armament, initially a 21cm howitzer was to be used. Eventually, this was changed to an experimental 38cm rocket launcher. Alcat was responsible for delivering a Tiger chassis. Brandenburg Ironworks was to design and construct the armored superstructure. The vehicle was shown to Hitler at a training camp in East Prussia on 20th of October 1943. It was designated as 38cm RW61 of Sturmmörser Tiger, or simpler just Sturm Tiger. Despite the impressively rapid prototype construction, mass production was severely hampered by the slow rate of manufacturing of Tiger tanks and was not due to start until mid-1944. Introducing the Sturm Tigers alongside the Tigers would have impeded desperately needed heavy tank production. Since priority was clearly given to the Tiger tank, the Sturm Tiger had to wait. As production was constantly delayed, there was a real chance that the whole project would be cancelled and the prototype scrapped. Rather than ditch the whole idea though, Hitler ordered that, instead of interrupting the production of the Tiger, the Sturm Tigers would be built on the chassis which had already been in action and suffered serious damage. Out of this stockpile of damaged tanks, the Germans managed to reuse 12th chassis. These were fully assembled by the end of September 1944. Five more were ordered by Hitler on the 23rd of September 1944. Those additional five vehicles were all finished by the end of December 1944, followed by orders for more, although these were never produced. In total, 18 Sturm Tigers were built. The running gear of the Sturm Tiger was identical to that of the Tiger, with the exception that only the prototype had rubber-tired wheels. The production Sturm Tigers were supposed to be fitted with rubber-tired road wheels to help manage the additional 8-ton load of the Sturm Tiger, but they all are seen with steel-rimmed wheels. Depending on the Tiger model used, it was powered either by a 650 horsepower Maybach HL210 TRM P45 or a stronger 700 horsepower Maybach HL230 TRM P45 petrol engine. With the additional weight, the Sturm Tiger was markedly slower and less maneuverable than the Tiger. The lower hull of the Sturm Tiger was that of the Tiger and remained unchanged. Nominally, the armor on the Tiger consisted of a lower front hull plate 100mm thick, a short glassy 60mm thick, and a reclined driver's plate 100mm thick. The sides were uniform 80mm thick and vertical on both lower and upper sections, and 80mm thick on the back. For the Sturm Tiger, the turret was removed, as was the roof of the hull over the fighting compartment. Further, the driver's plate was mostly gone, with the top half of it cut off across the full width. Replacing all of this was a large flat-sided box superstructure containing all the crew and the main gun. The front of this box was made from a single 150mm thick slab of armor plate angled back at 45 degree, which extended down to a point about halfway along the length of the glassy. It was held to the front of the hull by two substantial armor plates bolted over the joint. In front of the plate was a large 69mm thick armored ball mount for the 38cm mortar and a small ball mount for the forward-firing MG34 machine gun. The gun and mount were also protected by a 150mm thick mantlet. 
On the left of the gun was a rectangular opening that accommodated the aiming telescope and below this a pair of small visors under a small cowl were placed for the driver. The sides and rear were made from 80mm thick slabs of armor but angled inwards towards the roof, which was 40mm thick. On the prototype, an additional 50mm thick slab of armor was bolted to the lower front hull of the Strum Tiger, but this feature was dropped from production vehicles, presumably to save weight. The main armament consisted of the Rheinmetall Borsig 38cm RW61 L5.4 rocket launcher. Quite interestingly, this weapon existed in two iterations at the time. The RAG-43 variant was a ship-mounted anti-aircraft weapon used for firing a cable-spooled parachute anchor creating a hazard for aircraft. The second, the RTG-38, was a land-based system. It was the latter that served as the basis of the main armament of the Sturm Tiger. With a range of 3,000 meter, it had originally been planned for use in coastal insulation by the German Navy firing depth charges against submarines. After testing, it proved to be a failure and its further development for such a purpose was abandoned. However, it still had a heavy punch that could be employed for engaging ground targets. Before installation inside the Sturm Tiger, it had to be modified which was done by Rheinmetall. Some of the gun barrels were modified with a heavy steel ring around the muzzle as a counterweight to make elevation easier, but other than the mounting, the gun was effectively the same as before. The shells for the weapon were extremely heavy, far too heavy for a man to load manually at 330 kilograms each. As a result, each of them had to be carried by means of a ceiling-mounted trolley from their rack to a roller-mounted tray at the breech. Once on the tray, four soldiers could then push it into the breech to load it. The whole process took 10 minutes per shot from loading, aiming, and elevating to firing. Given their size, only 12 rounds could be carried internally. No special resupply vehicle was provided to carry additional shells, but this could be carried in trucks by the unit, which would allow the Sturm Tiger to be reloaded having withdrawn from combat. Reloading of these huge shells was carried out employing a roof-mounted crane which was erected on the back of the cab and lowered shells through a removable hatch in the roof of the casemate and down onto the stowage racks. The Sturm Tiger could fire two types of shell, an explosive shell for general use and a hollow charge shell specifically for targeting reinforced concrete structures, as a warhead could penetrate up to 2.5 meter of reinforced concrete. The range, however, was dependent on temperature, ranging from a maximum of 4,200 meter at minus 40 degrees Celsius to 5,900 meter at 50 degrees Celsius and 6,650 meter at 15 degrees Celsius. This very large difference in shell performance was because it used a combustion process which was lower burning in cold weather. The result was a usage of very lengthy range temperature tables for the crew in order to accurately lay the gun. Not only was the range affected by temperature, but so was shell flight and accuracy. To account for these discrepancies, temperature measurements were important in the vehicle and the crew was provided with detailed range table listing the elevation, range, and temperature to maintain accuracy. The minimum range for firing from the table was just 50 meter. Each shell used the same rocket motor and each case was thin walled with 32 venturi holes in the bottom to fan out the propellant gas. The venturi holes were angled at 14 degrees to the axis of the rocket, and together with the splines that went into the rifling of the gun, caused the shell to rotate clockwise in flight for stability. The rocket launcher had an elevation of 0 and 85 degrees and a traverse of 10 degrees each way. The barrel was radically different in design from other guns, with a cast outer body and a liner inside made from steel about 12 mm thick. In this liner were nine rifling grooves into which splines on the rocket would sit and then rotate during firing. The gas produced during the firing was vented through the gaps between the inner barrel and the outer barrel sheath. The two pieces of the barrel were held together at the breech and muzzle with steel rings. 32 holes allowed the gas from combustion to be vented forwards, keeping it out of the crew space and reducing the recoil of the gun. 16 of the 18 Sturmtigers were issued to three tank assault companies, the 1000th, the 1001st, and 1002nd. Initially, these were to be outfitted with 14 vehicles each. Instead, the 1000th received 4, while the 1001st and 1002nd received 6 each. Two vehicles were used to form a platoon. 
The 1000th was officially formed on the 13th of August 1944. The first platoon was moved to Poland to help crush the Warsaw Uprising. After this, there were plans to send them to Bratislava to quell the Slovak Uprising, but that rebellion petered out before the unit was sent. In December 1944, the 1000th, with its three operational vehicles, was to participate in the German operation in the Ardennes. As a result of problems with transportation though, these vehicles never reached the starting point and took no part in the offensive. By the end of January 1945, this company had been redesignated as an artillery unit and the strength had been increased to six vehicles. These were used to bombard the US 113th Cavalry Group in early February 1945. When the 113th Cavalry captured the town of Bedburg, they found an abandoned Sturmtiger. The 737th U.S. Tank Battalion during actions around the town of Menden also reported being attacked by a Sturmtiger, thought to be from this unit. The 1001st was officially formed on the 23rd of September 1944. It took one more month before parts of this unit were combat ready. On 10th November 1944, this unit, with three operational vehicles, was attached to the 6th SS Panzer Army for the Ardennes Offensive vehicle from this company actually managed to reach the front lines. Its objective was to help capture the Belgian city of Liege. As the German forces never got close to Liege, the 1001st instead saw action around Duren and Eiskirchen just before the new year, covering the retreat of German forces. During the action at Duren on 26 February 1945, one Sturmtiger was knocked out when the driver got the vehicle stuck in a ditch along the roadside during the withdrawal from the town. Immobilized, it was shot at least three times in the rear by a Sherman tank of C Company 743rd Tank Battalion. With the rear armor penetrated and the vehicle stuck, the crew bailed out. This vehicle was later recovered in March 1945 by the 464th Ordnance Evacuation Company and shipped to Great Britain for evaluation. The vehicle was later scrapped, but the gun remains on display at a tank museum, Bovington. The final action of the 1001st Company took place in the defense of Trollshagen to the east of Bonn in the spring of 1945. Shortly after, which has three Sturmtigers left and with serious problems with maintenance, the vehicles were destroyed by the crews prior to capture. The final 1002nd Company was formed in October 1944 and was sent to the west in December 1944. Its combat history started at the Battle of the Reichswald. By the middle of March 1945, the unit had exhausted its supplies and the last two vehicles were blown up by their crews. This concludes our video and the Sturmtiger. What do you think? Did the Germans overdo this one or was the Sturmtiger one of those projects that came too late to matter? Is there really no thing like overkill? Share your opinions in the comment section. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to subscribe to stay updated on future content. If you'd like to contribute further, consider supporting us on Patreon or Paypal. Your contributions help us create more engaging videos. Until next time, stay focused and stay tuned.